I'm going to meditate on the rest of the day. Cattle are lowing, and the baby Jesus doesn't just wake up without a cry. Okay. Get back, get back to the topic. John chapter 1 today, we are looking and continuing at our series, Discovering Gospel Centeredness. And again, welcome here to our church, always, and welcome to those who are live streaming in. We are so thankful for you. Uh, but here in John chapter 1, we uh, started a new series last Sunday. And we're continuing on up until Christmas Eve service where we'll take a little break to uh, take memory or honor the festivities of, of the season. Uh, but we're continuing on here in our Discovering the Gospel Centerness art series. And we started our new mini-series last Sunday titled Behold the Lamb, Behold the Lamb. And I think my little flashpoint sticky thingy isn't connecting to my clicker here. Let me see if I can get it on there. There we go. Behold the Lamb. And as we looked at that, why do we call that? Because the very first title that's given to Jesus in the flesh, notice the paraphrase there. You know, he was, the very first title he was given in the whole book to John was the title, The Word. But the very first title that was given to him in the account of the story of Jesus and the beginning of where John introduced was titled, the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God is what John the Baptist said. And we looked at that in great detail last Sunday about that Lamb of God title and uh, kind of ended with the thought that, you know, even John the Baptist was human at best. He had his own faults and it seemed like through the accounts that John had written and others as well uh, that the Baptist always kind of struggled a little bit. Um, just a bit, you know, wasn't, didn't seem like, you know, we understand that he is in heaven now, but he did seem to kind of struggle with the grasp that his cousin, Jesus, really was the son of God. And there was accounts of a few times where he asked Jesus, are you truly the Messiah? But here he was more, more solely convinced, even with the little doubt he had, he was more so convinced as he called his cousin Jesus the Lamb of God. And we looked at that again last Sunday, and we're going to continue off from that, from that account. To, this is where John the Baptist is looking back, and he says, I remember that day. You know, Matthew and Mark, uh, they did the account of how it was. John kind of writes back in, in the past sense. We notice that because of verse 31, or I'm sorry, verse 29, no, uh, verse 19, where it says, now this is the testimony of John the Baptist uh, there. And then also in verse 32, where we're going to read, and John bore witness. These were kind of past tense words. Uh, John the Baptist is kind of recollecting what happened on this day. And so this is where we are starting out in John uh, chapter 1, verse 32. We'll end in 34. And then next Sunday, we'll be beginning to see the life of Jesus. And we'll be beginning to read, if you have a certain kind of Bible, uh, we'll begin to read the red words, as, they, as they're called. And so we'll be seeing the life of Jesus in the very first person account, even starting next Sunday. But we don't want to remiss this. I think so often enough, uh, again, one of those things like the Lord's Supper and one of those things like a marriage and a funeral, we kind of know how these things proceed. And because, of, because we've been to one or two in our lifetime, uh, we've watched them on movies, we've read about them, we did a little... The magnificence of it, the pompous of it, the ceremonial of it, it's a little too overwhelming for the freshness to kind of go away. And I think this text that we're going to be reading, the baptism of Jesus, is very much the same. If I were to ask you to recount the story of Jesus' baptism, you would probably almost word for word give me this account. Well, yes, we know that John the Baptist baptized him. The heavens opened up, the Holy Spirit came down, and the Father said that one of those most very popular verses, uh, Behold, this is the Son that I am most well pleased. And so we all understand that, but again, I don't want to take away from this and just kind of fast forward through it, because this is really a significant verse, a really significant passage. In fact, if you stop and think about it, it was a supernatural event. Just how often does the Father part the clouds and the Holy Spirit come down like a dove on somebody and God actually talks in the flesh. Here's the supernatural talking into the realm of the natural and the natural hears him, uh, him being the Father God. 
And so this is a supernatural event, one that does and is worthy of our consideration. And so what does this event declare? What does this event show? What is going on in this picture that the Father is showing unto John the Baptist in the beginning form of Jesus and his ministry? Really, uh, trying to self point, but what we'll talk about the remainder of the morning is the Trinity is manifested. Really, a word that just means it's made known. It's declared. It's simplified. Uh, the hidden gospel, the hidden message of the Old Testament is now trying to begin to reveal anew. Here, the Trinity is beginning to show itself. Here, Jesus, that missing component, uh, that the second two components that hasn't yet quite been seen in the human eye. The Father was the one, and the pre-incarnate Jesus was in the Old Testament. Here, Jesus is becoming of the flesh, and now the Father calls him not only the Son of God or the angel of the Lord, as the Old Testament calls him, but now he calls him his own Son. And so this is a powerful event. This is where the Trinity is beginning to make itself known. And we're going to see the power of the Trinity in our lives. So, kind of taking all that and to put it aside for just a second. How many of you have been doing your Christmas shopping? How many of you have been doing the Christmas shopping? How many of you are done with your Christmas shopping? How many of you, how many of you are going to be waiting until the week of Christmas to start your shopping. You're, you're my daredevils. Larry, I'm so shot. <laughs> uh, well, I, was, I heard a story not too long ago about a customer that w- walked into a store around this time of the season, a Christmas season. And you know, like I do, you know, everywhere and everywhere and even under the rock and under the creek beds, it seems like everybody and their mother has a Black Friday deal or a Christmas sale going on. And, uh, and uh, they're just trying to get people to come in to buy their items. Well, this lady saw in the newspaper that there was a sale going on in one of the local pant companies, uh, probably a Levi company, a Levi store in, in the mall. And so she went to the mall, went into the Levi store and said, and talked to the clerk who was there. And she said, hey, I saw the ad on the paper that you have pants 50% off. And the man's been working there for years. In fact, he was a very well-respected man. And he said, uh, ma'am, I'm sorry, we didn't put an ad in the paper, or we don't have any Christmas sales going on today. And the woman, her name was Karen, she got a little, she got a little upset about that. And so she talked to the clerk again, and she said, no, I remember seeing your ad in my morning paper today. And so the clerk was a little bit more humble and patient than with this lady than even I could be. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, there's a newspaper station right outside the window. He said, let's go buy a newspaper. It's only a nickel, and we'll look at the paper today together. And she went out, and they both, real, they both validated that that was the same newspaper today. And so they put in their coin, out comes the newspaper, and, and they began to look. And behold, lo and behold, there was a pant company that had a sale, but it was not the Levi company in that mall. And so he told the lady, he said, here, see, this is, this is the sale that's going on in the different store. And the woman just looked at it, and she shook her head, and she said, well, it still shows that pants are on sale, and I expect a sale. Some people, there's just some people you can't ever get through to them. They think they're right, and they'll die on that hill. Though, on the other hand, there are some issues that should never be up for debate, that we should never lose ground on. Today we'll be looking at one of those found in the Word of God today, and that is, of course, the Trinity itself. And uh, it'll be the objective for us today to show how important the Trinity is, not only in our beliefs, because us as Christians, we are that's the cornerstone of our bedrock of belief, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, but it's also done as, hopefully, if I do, if I do it well and the, and the Lord is with us, of course, uh, we'll also see how the Trinity is impactful not only in our beliefs, but in our everyday living, even today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we read the passage before us this morning and ask for his blessings upon the Word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you once more. And Lord, we ask now that as we read your word, that you'll allow us to not be distracted. Lord, this is the time of the year where so much can take away from our focus, not only the everyday hustle and bustle of our life, but 
Now on top of that, Lord, we have extra events that we plan, seasonal events, celebrations, parties, family festivities, decorations. Lord, so much takes up our time. At, and uh, these are good things. But Lord, help us to not be distracted by just these good things. Help us to remain focused on the best thing, the most important thing. And that's the relationship we have with you. Lord, we pray that the word will speak to our hearts today, that for some it may encourage comfort, for others it may challenge, maybe a preconcept that we, that we hold on to, maybe something that we don't allow to impact our everyday living. Lord, we just ask that the Holy Spirit will have free reigns in our hearts, our minds, our spirit, and Lord, that we will be able to draw closer to you today than when we came in this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like we talked about just a few moments ago, John the Baptist had the account. Remember where we read the verse four, four words here, verse 32, John bore witness. John, John had an account. We read that account even last Sunday where he said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God, the one who was preferred before me because he was before me. And so all this is his account. And we see all the account from what we looked at last Sunday is now confirmed in this event, the Trinity being manifested, the baptism of Jesus. And that's your first aspect today as we look at it. We have two aspects we're looking at. And the first one of our aspect of this story is that the Baptist witness was confirmed. The Baptist witness was confirmed. What was the witness? Well, let's read the passage today in these first 32 to 34. And John, talking about John the Baptist, bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit, capital S, showing that this is the Holy Spirit, descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him, him being Jesus, who entered into the scene last Sunday. I did not know him. Remember, he used that same phrase last Sunday. I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that we see as a different person altogether. And I have seen and testified, John says from all this account, that this is the Son of God. So John wasn't a schizophrenic. He wasn't a maniac. He wasn't bipolar. He didn't have multiple personality disorder. This was a literal account of three different people. So let me kind of break that down in case, uh, you know, there's a lot of he's and him's in here and just want to clarify what we're looking at. So we see that the, the other element of this picture was Jesus. And this is where verse 29 told us from last Sunday. Next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. And if you looked at and read, um, we don't have time for that this morning, but if you looked at the other Gospels as they uh, supplement this account, we'll see that Jesus came and actually had a conversation with John. And John pretty much told Jesus, Jesus, I'm not going to baptize you. And Jesus looked at John and said, yes, you are. And then John said, fine, I will. And so and then, then, they be, then they began to baptize. And then the father came and said, oh, this is the son of whom I'm well pleased, and so on and so forth. So that's the supplements to this story. So John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descending from heaven like the dove, and he, putting a pronoun to the Spirit, he, the Holy Spirit, remained upon him. Now there's only one other person in the flesh in this world that is in the presence of John, and that's Jesus. The Holy Spirit remained upon Jesus. But I did not know Jesus. I did not know him to be the Christ. As we speculated last Sunday, John to the surface and said, you know what, I'm not 100% certain it's my cousin. But he who sent me, now there's a whole other person all together. Christ would not send John ahead of time to baptize himself. Otherwise, John would have said, I knew him. But John said, I didn't know him. So who was it that sent him? Well, do we see the third element? And that's, why, and that's where John confirms it with the last three words of, the, of verse 34. The third element is the Father. He who sent me to baptize with water. The same person that was sent in verse number 6 of John chapter 1. There was a man sent from God 
whose name was John. So he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, Jesus, this is he, Jesus, who will baptize or who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen, now this is back to John as he recounts his whole collection and testified that this, this person, this one that I baptized, the one who the Holy Spirit came down, is the Son of God. So the, John the Baptist was not 100% certain of whom the Messiah was, but was told of the signs that would take place. The Father told him, he said, then look, you will know who the Messiah is. You will, have, you will have the confirmation, as we looked at in our title. You will have your confirmation when the Spirit, when the Spirit comes down upon that person. Though he was uncertain, though, notice what he continued to do. In verse number 33, I did not know him, but he who has sent me to baptize with water. John continued to baptize with water. In fact, if you look at the other accounts of Matthew, Mark, uh, Matthew and Mark and, and Luke to some degree, we'll find that John not only baptized the local area, but he also baptized many of the Jews in the area of Israel and many from Jerusalem. John was continuing his ministry, and his ministry was flourishing because he was doing that which God has sent them to do. So he, was not, he did not slow down. He did not sit on his, on his rump waiting for Jesus to come. You know, if somebody told me, the Father, you know, if I had a supernatural insight, say God parted the clouds and said, hey, the, pers- the Messiah is coming back, and he's going to come back. And I know I said that he's going to come back in the clouds, and he will in just a few seconds, but... Jesus is actually needing to make a pit stop, and so he's going to stop at Tetz's Roadhouse before he comes in the clouds, and he's going to order a very specific thing. He's going to order a diet coat with three tubes of ice, and he's going to order a T-bone steak, and he's going to get mashed potatoes on the side. I would sit there at Tetz's Roadhouse day and night, and I wouldn't care who came and who went until I see that one person, and I'd be like, okay, that's Christ. See, this is how specific John the Baptist had the account of. No other person that he was baptizing was ever going to see the Holy Spirit come down upon him. This was reserved for Jesus Christ. And so he could have said and waited. He said, you know what? I'm waiting for the person just right. I'm waiting for that one person that I, know, that I have an I have a estimation of who the Christ is. He could have filtered it all. He said, hey, what, have you sinned? Have you lied to anybody? Okay, you're not Jesus. Let me wait, let me, I'm going to be waiting for Jesus. He could have completely wrecked his ministry. He could have did a number of things. But John the Baptist continued to focus on what was set before him. He continued to baptize. He continued to prophesy that the Messiah was coming. He continued to, through the, through the ministry of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, help lead others to the knowledge and presence of the Lord. And I think there's an example here, if we're not careful to overlook it. To see, these words, sometimes we get a little, get a little uh, flustered with all the pronouns, and we can just continue on and read until we see the actual supernatural event. But there's an example that John left before us. See, much like John, we do not know when Jesus will arrive. If I were to ask any one of you today, or do you know 100% when Jesus Christ is going to come back? I remember, and I should be off on my years here, but I, I think I'm pretty well within the mark, uh, before my time, but it was quite a popular tale, that there was a gentleman who came in the 80s, and he wrote in especially 1988, 88 reasons that Jesus Christ will come back to 1988. He missed it, or otherwise I wouldn't have ever been thought of. But until he missed it that year, it was a very popular bestseller, and you can actually tr- probably go back and buy two of these books. I'm sure they still sell them for uh, dads or for some lessons of misprophecy, but he realized that he was wrong about 1988 and he wrote another book in 1989 and he wrote 89 reasons why Jesus will come back to 1989. I think the uh, publisher told him to not worry about 1990. You know, that, that we, don't need a, we don't need a sequel here. People all over the world, there is people all over the world that believe they have the exact details, the exact date of when Jesus is coming back. But the Bible tells us in Revelation, no man knows except for the Father himself, not even the Son who sits at the right hand of him. He's waiting upon the Father to tell him. 
And so much like John, we don't, know, we don't know when Jesus will arrive on the scene. But we should continue the work that God has called us to do. You know, I think for many of us, we've grown a little accustomed, a little privileged with the fact that no matter what we do, because our salvation is secure, we're going to heaven. Can I tell you that should not stop you from sharing the gospel and living the gospel as a testimony unto others. There are people that very well may be anchored on your words, on your relationship, on your good intentions to share that hope unto them that they would have never wise received from anybody else. And so we need to continue sharing the gospel. We need to continue being in the gospel. We need to continue being a disciple. And so notice again that with whom and where this miraculous event took place, it, uh, with whom and where the event took place, it was there in Beth Rabba, Bethany, as some of the verses applied earlier. But again, looking at the fact here, we see the Father, we see the Son being baptized, and we see the Spirit coming down. And I think for, for most, again, all of us, as we read through this account, we focus on those three aspects. But again, I want to remind you of that fourth element, the one that I believe many of us, and myself included, without really studying the Scripture here for a length of time, often forget and just kind of read on and continue on in my readings and devotions, is that John, the Baptist, who was 100% man, had a part to play in Jesus' baptism and Jesus' rather birth of his ministry that would last for three and a half years or so. Meditate on this if you would, besides the fact that the towel's low and Jesus Christ never woke up crying. You, can, you, can not, you don't have to think about this, but meditate on, the, on this one I, I asked you today. God could have chosen any other way to baptize Jesus. God could have allowed Jesus to come on, God being the Father, Jesus to attain into our world with the Holy Spirit already touched upon him, the Holy Spirit already dwelt upon him. Uh, God the Father could have declared every year, once a year on Christ's birthday, this is the Son of God who turns 17. This is the Son of God who turns 18. God could have done anything. But he waited. He chose to allow a human instrument, John the Baptist, to herald in the beginning ministry of the Son of God. How many of you have ever had to wait on your children to do something? I'm not quite there yet, and if I'm a little honest with you, I'm not really holding my breath for it either. But I've heard that once, I, once Alina gets to a certain age, she's going to develop, if she has any much more room, I don't think she does, but she'll develop even a little bit more independence to where she wants to do everything herself. And so I'm, I've heard and I've heard the stories and I've already r reminisced on other accounts that when everybody, mom and dad, ready to rush out the house, here comes a little Lena says, I do it myself. Well, let me just put the jacket on. No, I do it myself. Let me put the shoes on. No, I do it myself. Or how many of you have been waiting on your kids to hurry up and get ready or to put something down? I mean, it seems like... Especially, especially as they get older, kids either have one speed, and it's their own speed. Nobody else's timeline. So here's the father of all universe who awaited on his creation for one person, his one child, his one kid. Not saying that John the Baptist was another son of God, but in a sense he was saved, and so he was, in his, he was a son of God. So here, here's the father's waiting on one of his children to do that which he was sent to do and waiting for the right time to do it. See, the creator waited on the created to perform the ministry for him to advance. In God's timeline, John the Baptist had to baptize the son. And then the Holy Spirit would come down and then the father would talk. This is what Jesus told John in the other accounts. When John the Baptist said, Hey, Jesus, you're God. I'm just a man. What can I do? I mean, why don't you just baptize yourself? I mean, no, no human should be doing this. 
And Jesus told John, he said, no, you need to do this. Every part of God's divine plan required human interaction and actions. It didn't necessarily require it because God couldn't do it. But in his plan, he allowed room for it to require human interaction and action. See, the Creator waited for John the Baptist to, to begin the ministry of Jesus. God used man to build the church, but he didn't have to. You know, when Jesus left, he left 12 men. 13, I guess, if you want to think about it. But he didn't have to. The Father used man to bring even his word, the Bible. Why so many scholars get huffy-puffy about this? Because man had an instrument in creating the words on this very page. That's why when we don't just see one thing, and it says this is the first chapter of the Elohim Jehovah God, and it goes from 1,800 other chapters. There are names written in here from the human authors that God chose, like Isaiah, Daniel, John, that we're reading. God chose human instruments to bring about much of his plan. Time after time, God awaits on mankind to act through and for mankind. I think John the Baptist is showing here in these few accounts something that's always been shown time and time again, that God has a purpose for your life. You know, sometimes I think we get a little swept away from the supremacy of God. And I don't mean to dilute God's supremacy. I think sometimes we get swept away from it. I think we oftentimes say, well, you know what? God is so magnificent. God is so great. He commands the seas. He commands the planets. He commands all things. Surely all is in his control. And yes, everything is in his control. But sometimes in your life, he's waiting for you to take the first step. He's waiting for you to take the first step to share the good news, to share the gospel with your friend. You know, I know we read that old verse and there's a song sung about it of Jesus Christ coming to the door and he's knocking. And are you going to answer? Can I tell you, no matter how many times you pray and wait, because of the prophecy foretold, Jesus Christ isn't going to come down in person and knock on your neighbor's door just because you don't feel like sharing the gospel to your neighbor. Guess who he left that for? You. Jason said I say this a lot, and it seems to be true, so at least I have to be smart about one thing I say from time to time, is that there's no coincidences in the plan of God. You think it's a coincidence that you are where you're at? that the people who are around you or were around you. I remember hearing about Mark's job, how they were waiting for the right person, and Mark, you were the only applicant. God works in the coincidences of life. There are people that God connect to you, and he's waiting for you to give, either to give them hope or to share with them the good news that there is hope that they haven't yet known. But so oftentimes we just await for God to do the work himself. So what is God waiting on you for? There's a, clear distinction, there's a clear distinction between the willing child of God and the one who won't walk with God. That gives us our next step here and one that we'll look at for the remainder of the series. And that is the de declaration of the Trinity or the remainder of the message, I have to say. The declaration of the Trinity. I don't know about you, but there's power. Really, there's power behind these verses. The, that God himself has started to reveal to himself um, unto mankind who he is. You know, that's one of the greatest questions that the world asks oftentimes. So who is God? Well, this is, this is the aspect of God showing himself to us. He is showing himself as the Elohim, as the three in one, and the Godhead that consists of three. There is power behind this account. John brings to light within the first chapter of his gospel that Jesus is the Son of God. That's kind of a remarkable, remarkable thing about John's account, one that I oftentimes, again, uh, took for granted because of our relationship with Jesus. But here John is writing the gospel for, primarily for others who don't know Jesus. 
And within the first chapter, he didn't wait to spill the beans until the last chapter. He didn't build up to a climax to get them ready to hear the news. Within the introductory, the introductory statement, within the very first chapter, John tells everybody, hey, by the way, Jesus is the Son of God. He emphasizes this with the witness of John the Baptist of the Trinity being declared. In fact, he repeats it over and over and over again. Remember our, our very first message in the introductory series of John when we looked over in John chapter 20 where John pretty much said, I wrote the book by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but in my mindset, I wrote the book for one thing only, to declare that Jesus is the Son of God so that anyone who reads this book may have life. He was absorbed with the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In fact, even in his older years, uh, in the last years of his life, he did not give it up. He repeats it boldly in his other letters, such as 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7. And you can write that to the side of your verse here if you'd like in this passage here. It's a great verse to reinforce the Trinity because it's one of the few verses that openly declare without any hidden thought that there is the Trinity there. Because John says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and we know who the Word is. We've spent literally the last four weeks now figuring out who the Word is, and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, these three are uno, one. John must declare this for the enemies of the world that were already attacking the deity of Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but there is a lot of people out there in this world that say they believe Jesus and they have no idea who the real Jesus is. Let me say that again. There are a lot of people in this world who say they believe Jesus, but they have no idea who the real Jesus Christ is. There's a lot of people who say that they're Christians that say, well, you know, I'm a Hindu or I'm a Muslim, and they've convinced Christians who haven't fully studied this topic for themselves that uh, what they believe is very coincidental with what we as Christians believe. No, oh, well, you know what? We believe in my religion. We believe in my faith that Jesus, that Jesus was a son of God. We believe that he was a great person. We, we know Jesus as a Christ. My friends, today there are many people in this world who believe in a diluted Jesus Christ, if I may say with grace. And this is not just in our life today, in this year today, but in the very first century of when Christ Christianity was left unto man and the supernatural was doing the thing and the Holy Spirit was doing its works, that, his works, that the enemies of the faith was already attacking the deity of Jesus. See, John was fighting the Gnostics of that day who tried to persuade Christendom that Jesus was simply a powerful spirit of God and therefore couldn't be God's son in the flesh because that's impossible. There were already Christians within the first within the first 100 years that Jesus went up to heaven that said, you know what? This is, this is a little too good to be true of a story. Jesus is really just a spirit. For God is so great, God is so majestic that he surely would not come down to take upon us our flesh, to take upon our sin and die. And many other of religions today have adopted that belief. In fact, if you look at, around the world, you can simply doodle this. It didn't take me about 15 minutes of, of research time to kind of get a bird's eye view, a snapshot. Today's religions such as Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, others such as Jehovah Witnesses, and Mormonism, and more, all claim that Jesus isn't the true, eternal Son of God, but in part, either in part or altogether something else. You say, well, that's fine, Pastor. We know that there's other religious beliefs, and we know that there's other religions in the world, but surely, you know, that's, that's their prerogative, and that's why we send missionaries over, and, you know, God will fix up that mess. Well, if that's what you believe, let me, let me just give you an approximate, and it may be a very loose approximate, but one that's very close to it, of 
all these religions, Buddhism, Islam, others such as Jehovah Witnesses and Mormonism, Hinduism, all these religions do believe in Jesus Christ. If you looked in their books and you looked in their statements of faith, you kind of looked in a little bit of theology, they do believe in Jesus Christ. And some of them say that he is a son of God, a son of God. Some of them claim that he is a great prophet or one that was sent by the creator of the universe. Many and all of them will include Jesus Christ. But they don't claim outright that he is either the Savior, the Messiah, or the Son of God, the Savior of our world. And so how many people believe this? Well, if you look, in a loose ballpark, about 3 billion and 300 million people believe in a form of Jesus Christ. That's a pretty big percentage. Can I tell you, that's almost, almost half of the entire world's population who believe in a form of Jesus Christ that don't know the real Jesus Christ. And I know 3 billion, 300 million, that's a, that's a pretty big number. Kind of a hard number to fathom. And there may be a million or so, more or less. I just said this is a very loose estimate. But just an approximation of all these who claim that religion and where they live at in the world and kind of a population sake here. 3.3 billion religious people. So how many people is 3.3 billion, if we can kind of illustrate that? Well, you see, the United States of America has 332 million people, approximately, as of the 2020 census. 332 million people live in the United States of America. So it would take 10 United States of Americas put together, all those societies put together, 10 Las Vegas, 10 San Francisco's, 10 Indianapolis, 10 of them, put them all together, all the people that we can think of, and that's how many people who live in this world who say they know Jesus, but they have absolutely no clue who the real Jesus is. It's safe to say that the father of this world is doing a pretty good job of distorting the truth. Not outright getting rid of it, but just twisting it enough that the message altogether is something entirely different. So when you remove, that, when you remove the, the deity of Jesus, when you claim that he is not the Son of God, what you're doing altogether is that you are destroying the Trinity. That's how powerful the Trinity is. You can't just take one out and say, oh, I still have the Trinity. You know, I can substitute one, and I still have the Trinity. I can dilute one, and I can still have the Trinity. You know, I don't care how much you call a peanut butter jelly sandwich. If all you have is peanut butters and two pieces of bread, you don't have a peanut butter jelly sandwich. You just have something that's edible to people who are sick. I don't care if you die. I don't care if you say, you know what, Cody? I'm not much. You know, I, I think, I think ch cheese can, be, can do just as well as jelly. You know, they're about the same concept. They're both ooey and sticky and dewy, and they make the mess of things. So I think a peanut butter and cheese sandwich is just as good as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It doesn't work that way. you got to have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You can't take one out and still say it's the Trinity. You can't replace one. You can't just say, well, one's just a, a something, not the something, and still say it's the Trinity. The Trinity is the outlined existence of who the Elohim is, the triune God. Without any part of it, we deny the true God who exists today. And therefore, we deny the only salvation that is given to us. You see, if Jesus is not part of God, then he could not properly save the world. Because it took God himself to save the world by, by allowing himself to be murdered by us. For Jesus Christ, remember we talked about that in the verse, verse 2 couple of sermons. This is not heresy. That Jesus Christ claimed that he is God. And that on Calvary, mankind in its darkest hour killed God. And thank the Lord he resurrected. All according to his plan. And if he did not properly die for us, if he was just a angel, if he was just a good prophet, if he was just a son of God, a creation, not God himself, then he didn't properly save us. And you and I are still living a damn life sentence eternity to hell. And this whole thing that we're doing as far as Christianity is pointless. Because our 
thesis, our center point, our basis is on the death of Jesus. And without the cross, our entire hope is for nothing because we still have our sin to pay for. This is what Jesus tells us in John 14, 6 and 7, which we'll look at hopefully sometime next year. This is why he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. See, when you remove him, you can't go to God. He says no one can go to God except through him. The Trinity is our cornerstone fundamental belief upon which everything else exists of the way of the Christian living, doctrine, and theology. It is the degree marked for separation. For if one cannot come in agreement upon the Trinity, then neither can they coincide with the doctrine of salvation. If we can't agree, if somebody, you know, if uh, somebody comes unto us or we have a conversation with somebody, we being you or me as an individual, and I can't come and, and I can't get them to agree that Jesus was the Son of God, then we can't come to agreement with salvation. And nothing else will really much matter as far as our conversation of religious views other than my purpose to see them saved in a loving and graceful way. And I remember those two words right there because I don't want you to leave this church and say, Pastor gave me the authority to be the inquisitor. And if nobody ever believes just like me do, I get the authority by God to be argumentative and ugly and rude. No, that's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is please don't... Uh, be misinformed or misguided when we have people out there in the world that believe something very similar but something altogether different and they could definitely confuse you at best. So they are therefore, whether consciously or not, lost and must be pressed on that issue before any other insignificant issue takes its place. Let's wrap this up today. So the manifestation of the Trinity at its core brings to light the same truth that we've witnessed every week in our series. This is why the Trinity is important to us. That without centering on the identity of Jesus Christ, all other matters are at a high risk of being faulty. If we don't know who Jesus Christ is, if we don't allow him to be the Lord of our life, the Son of God, then everything that we believe about Christianity could be at fault or altogether wrong. If, for example, if the foundation of the house isn't right, then the rest of the house is at risk of collapsing. It doesn't matter how good the house is. It doesn't matter how well-informed and how beautiful and how, the, how everything makes sense in the house. It's all just flowing from one concept to the other. If the foundation of that house is cracked and faulty, then the house is at jeopardy to collapse within itself. Gospel-centered living demands of us what, that we hold the deity of Jesus at the very center of who we are. For when that is right, then what flows outward will be a life-giving, a love-filled, and joy-sustaining life worth living. This will not only bless us, but will, allow, but will flow outward to our family, our friends, and those around us in our church who needs that from us. That's the blessing about being a gospel-centered Christian, is that it doesn't only help you. As God used John the Baptist to net with others, so he uses us to, to net with others and share that hope. We were talking about that in our Sunday school class today. How oftentimes those who are lost need to know that hope. And those who are saved oftentimes need to be reminded of that hope. And that's where you and I take place at times. So my question for you today is, do you know? Are you like John the Baptist? Nobody has seen Jesus in this lifetime. If you have, please let me know. I have some questions for you. But are you like John the Baptist that says, I have testified that this is the Son of God? Do you testify that Jesus is the Son of God and the Lord of your life? Or is he like as the Pharisees, someone who at times we reject to continue living the life that we've created for ourselves? That's what 3.3 billion other people in this world quite possibly have done. Those who 
know Jesus from a distance, but they won't make him the center of their life. They won't surrender to him. They won't ask him to save them because they believe they don't need saved from Jesus. Can I tell you that without Jesus, we are nothing. That all good things come from the Father of light, come from Jesus. That we are consistent, that we are constrained, Colossians tells us, by Jesus who holds the very fabric of our life in his hands. We belong to Jesus whether we know it or not. And so do you know him? Do you testify of him? Do you bear witness of him? I hope and pray you do. If not, if you haven't done that lately, this would be a great season to start. We've got many things going forward this month. This would be a great time to invite others to come. This would be a great time to share the good news unto others. I was just watching not too long ago and reading an article, of, in fact, about how Christmas and Thanksgiving and this kind of uh, five to six weeks is one of the h- hardest times for people who fight depression and loneliness because... The holidays bring back remembrance of good times in the past. Can I tell you, there are people out there that need to be reminded of that hope. That there's a Savior whose name is Jesus who will never leave you, never forsake you, and will hold your hands all the way until the day we get to heaven. Let's go to that Savior in prayer today. Well, thank you for taking some time out of your day and spending it with us right here at Fairbanks. And I hope that you enjoyed today's service. No doubt that you've been challenged by the message and uh, you've probably made a couple of decisions. But really, I want to ask you if you've made one decision today. Maybe you made it many months ago, years ago. I just want to ask you and take this opportunity right now. Just me and you. It doesn't have to be anybody else. Uh, perhaps it's just you as a family. Maybe it's you as an individual. But I want to ask, do you know for certain today if you have a relationship with Jesus? If you do, then terrific. And I pray that the sermon challenged you to draw closer to him and have a better walk with him going forward from today. But if you're uncertain, if you're saying, Cody, I don't know if I would die today, if I would go to heaven. I don't know if I have that relationship with Jesus. I'm kind of uncertain at this point. Then can I ask you if you would be encouraged enough, if, if you would be comfortable enough to message us right here at Fairbanks Missionary Baptist Church on our Facebook. Maybe even send us an email on our website at fmbcin.com. If that's a little uncomfortable with you, I would love to talk to you directly. You can always reach me right here in our Fairbanks Missionary Baptist Church page on Facebook or even my personal page directly, Cody Eaton on Facebook. And I would love to talk with you about that relationship with Jesus. There is no other greater decision that you could be making today without knowing for certain that that relationship is, in fact, alive inside of you. So if you're uncertain, I'd love to talk about that with you. But if you do know, and the message that spoke with you today, I would love for you to reach out and communicate with us, maybe even share a comment right now on our video. Uh, just say, you know what, I, the Lord spoke with me today. I've made a decision today. Or even just share a praise. We would love to hear that. And if you have anything that you'd wish to talk about, please feel free to, feel free to reach out to me. And I would be uh, encouraged. I would be so appreciative if we would be able to take some time to talk directly with you. What can I say? God bless you and God be with you until we meet right back here next week only at Fairbanks. God bless.